again. Hopefully the mic works. Great. Jill, that was uh, clutch with the batteries for the microphone. Uh, like she said, my name is Eric Von Flam. Uh, today I am the head of the uh, intellectual property department at Cooper Levinson. Uh, that's a national law firm uh, with offices in five cities around the country. Uh, <clears throat> intellectual property, that, that's actually a, a phrase that everybody is like, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, and when I say it, they kind of look at me like I have three eyes in my head. <clears throat> but it's pretty simple, actually. And all it means is property created by the mind, by your imagination. It's really the law of human imagination, uh, which I kind of find fascinating about it. <clears throat> now, everybody here creates intellectual property. Uh, artists uh, create uh, works of copyright. Uh, marketers create works of trademark and so on. So uh, every one of you actually needs to know something about intellectual property. It's really important. In fact, I've really made a career out of representing people who have made mistakes because they're not aware of intellectual property and their rights in it uh, and, you know, uh, have created problems for themselves. <clears throat> um, Artists create copyright, like I said. Uh, you know, that could be anything from painting, uh, uh, literature, sculpture, software, uh, film, music, anything like that. Uh, that's all in the realm of copyright. And the trick about intellectual property rights is actually to establish exclusive rights in it. Um, something you really need to know how to do. <clears throat> Uh, I usually lecture on intellectual property rights, and uh, today they asked me specifically, don't lecture on intellectual property rights. <laughs> Instead, they want me to uh, discuss my career, my life journey, so to speak, uh, which I've never done before. This is a little strange for me. Uh, I have really dedicated my career to uh, representing artists. Uh, in any form, uh, a lot of uh, high-level um, music artists, models, modeling agencies, you'll name it. You'll see, you'll see a bunch of them today. Uh, but the reason I was always interested in representing artists and protecting their rights is because I was myself an artist. Uh, for a large part of my life, uh, I was a painter. Uh, and um, one of the tips I'll give you this morning, actually, is how to sell your paintings. If uh, artists have trouble selling their work, I figured out a way where I actually couldn't paint them fast enough. I was selling so many, and this is how I did it. I walked into the Waldorf Astoria uh, Hotel. It's a famous hotel in New York City. And I went to their banquet department, and I asked to speak to the banquet manager. And I asked them, like, what charity is here the most? You know, which charity has the most dinners at, at your hotel? And he gave me the name of a, a hospital in New York, um, and I contacted them. And I said, listen, during the cocktail hour, when nobody has anything to do, you know, let me set up some uh, easels with paintings and stuff, and whatever I sell, I'll give you half, right? In two years, I sold over 100 paintings. I couldn't paint them fast enough. Uh, because if you think about it, they, people that go to these charity dinners, they're there to make donations anyway. They've got their checkbook. Uh, they love seeing the original art. They love talking to the artist. Like, I could not sell them fast enough. And I, I thought I was going to do that um, as a career. Um, and I realized not all my paintings, but some of the paintings were very personal to me. And I hated actually selling them. Um, I just hated that. And um, so I decided not to be an artist as a career. But it was always, you know, I was always an artist since a very early age. It was in my blood. So naturally, you know, when I uh, went to law school and in my practice, I've sort of gravitated towards that area. Uh, my muse uh, was always uh, light and form. I was fascinated by that. Everything I looked at, 
in terms of painting came boil down to light and form. So that was really my source of inspiration. <clears throat> uh, okay, first slide. <clears throat> Uh, my first sort of job, I guess, in the world of the arts uh, was as president of Cook Records. Emery Cook is actually the man who invented stereo uh, binaural recording. Uh, so uh, it was a fascinating guy, and what a brilliant audio engineer he was. Uh, we, uh, I had some people buy his uh, label and his plant and I, I became uh, president of the, they had a huge audio catalog, really because his uh, manufacturing process was like the best in the world. Um, so I learned a little something there about the music business. Uh, and then I went to law school and uh, I had a partner who was himself a musician. So between uh, me as a fine artist and my partner as a musician, naturally, we, we developed that specialty. Ah, my first big name client. It was a fellow named Peter Tosh. I'm not sure if anybody remembers him. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I took this uh, off uh, Google Images. You know, I had to get a, a, a picture of him smoking ganja and, uh, and uh, his album was legalized. It. So he was actually a very early proponent of legalizing marijuana, which, you know, through efforts like that, that's actually happening today. Uh, is that right? Okay, I uh, represented Meatloaf, uh, very nice guy. Um, I can't give you all the anecdotes today. This is like, I tried to compile my best stories, but uh, I don't have time for that. So uh, if you wanna know why, for example, Meatloaf made no money off the Bat Out of Hell album, which is his huge album, you can ask me afterwards. <clears throat> uh, I grabbed this photo um, off the internet. This is Latoya Jackson, uh, one of my clients. Uh, I, this is a picture with uh, Jack Gordon, her husband slash manager. Plenty of stories there. <clears throat> uh, Hootie and the Blowfish. This was interesting. This is our first act that you know was super successful. Uh, they had um, their first album, which was Cracked Review, had uh, something over 17 million units sold. It's like almost the, the record uh, on, on uh, debut albums. Uh, that case was, interestingly enough, uh, a, a management dispute, and uh, they had a, an ex-manager, sort of, who was suing them for like 70 million bucks, and it's the largest uh, management dispute in history. Of course, uh, we settled that. It's confidential, so I can't tell you, but we settled it well. <laughs> uh, yeah, you might know Madonna. Uh, her... Uh, first hit song was Holiday, uh, and uh, Mary Blige had done uh, a soundtrack for Barbershop 2 movie, uh, included a song called Not Today, <clears throat> and uh, very interesting, we had a, I was suing Blige and Dre and Puff Daddy and everybody else um, because of that, uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, the only part of the song that she copied was the hook. Uh, I promised my wife I wouldn't sing the hook for you, but I think I have to, just so you know. So Madonna's song is, you know, holiday E. You all remember that, right? Uh, and in um, Blige's song, it was not today E, like that. And of course, the hook is a very important part of the song. <clears throat> but the trouble in that case was the songs were otherwise incredibly different. <clears throat> and these are very expensive lawsuits to bring. You need musicologists, experts. It's like, you know, there's a technical aspect of it, but there's also just sort of a layperson interpretation of the song. And, you know, and I want to do a good job for Madonna. And I <clears throat> really, you know, we're litigating this for years at tremendous cost. <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm realizing, oh my God, I'm going to get killed at trial because when, the, when a, the jury hears the two songs, they're going to think they're completely different without, you know, sort of appreciating the importance of the hook. And then, as a miracle, we discovered that Mary Blige had done a ringtone license for Not Today. And if you don't know what a ringtone license is, uh, years ago, kids used to pay for music, a little like a 10-second snippet of a song, as the ringer on their cell phone, right? That's a ringtone license. And the 10 seconds that, of course, 
uh, Blige selected was the, uh, the not today right, aspect of her song, which completely undermined her defense, and that's another case that we settled well with another wink. <clears throat> now, that was the only time, actually, that a ringtone license was used as a sound infringement uh, um, basis. Uh, Wu-Tang Clan. <clears throat> um, you might not think it by the way I'm dressed, but uh, I'm credited with discovering the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, I can't really take all the credit. Uh, it was a producer uh, client of mine, a fellow named Ross Rhoda, uh, brought the, uh, the Wu-Tang Clan in. And they were nobody when we, uh, when we took them in. And it's another example of you know, what happens in the entertainment business when you become successful. At that point, you know, sort of money just rains down on you for the rest of your life. It's what everybody's hoping to sign. Um, one of my favorite stories about the Wu-Tang Clan, I hope I have enough time, uh, is my partner had done their renegotiation, and that's part of negotiating their, their, um, their contracts with the record companies, where they loosen up a lot of money. <clears throat> uh, and the clan used to come to our offices in posses of like a dozen people, sometimes with guns. <clears throat> um, so there was this scene in the conference room where the, the uh, renegotiation contract was like 500 pages long, one of the most complex agreements of any kind. Um, and he, he's sitting there with like this 500 page contract and like the Wu-Tang clans are sort of assembled in front of him and he goes, this shit is fat. That's all he said, this shit is fat. And they go like, shit's fat? He goes, nice sign. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> uh, I've represented modeling agencies in the city, uh, including Metropolitan Model Management, one of the top agencies in the world. Uh, and I uh, included a photo of Claudia Schiffer, uh, one of the top models in the world, uh, which they had at the time I represented them. Uh, New York Improv. I was actually a partner in uh, the uh, New York Improv. Uh, also another great story. I probably don't have time to go into it now. But uh, it was sort of like the War of the Roses between Silver Friedman, who actually started the improv in New York, and her husband, Bud Friedman, who opened one in the West Coast. <clears throat> Penthouse Magazine. <clears throat> I actually represented uh, General Media. Uh, and my Bob Guccione stories is one of my best stories. Um, ask me about the Bob Guccione story afterwards. Uh, but it was wonderful knowing him. By the way. Bob Guccione, if you don't know, was himself a fine artist and painter his whole life. Uh, I think that was his first love, and he was very dedicated to painting, and his paintings were interesting, and I enjoyed talking to him about that. <clears throat> uh, wild Style. <clears throat> this is, um, I represented an artist by the name of Michael Tracy, who was actually the very first graffiti artist who did the interlocking letters, like you see here. In fact, he named his style of graffiti art Wild Style. Uh, he was my first uh, copyright trial. <clears throat> and uh, so we won, and he turns to me uh, in the courtroom and says, you know, they could have bought a Picasso cheaper. <clears throat> so that was good. Uh, this is, uh, I took this slide from my my presentation on IP, uh, Bill, I represented fashion photographers as well. Uh, Bill Diodato was a very famous uh, fashion photographer, and he did something incredibly innovative in uh, the picture on the left. Uh, he was actually doing a fashion photo, and you know, typically fashion photos are very glitzy and glamorous and you know, high end, uh, but he did a, a photo really to sell shoes and handbags. Uh, but his photo was a, a model like in a public toilet a stall, and you could just see that under the, under the door of the stall. And it was pretty groundbreaking at the time. Uh, Kate Spade hired somebody to copy him, and uh, I think what I have written here is example of bad faith and willfulness. Uh, that's because Kate Spade specifically hired somebody to copy his photo. Um, actually, it's funny, the, uh, the lower court opinion, the trial court, found there was no infringement. And uh, 
Most uh, IP lawyers think that was the result in that case, but we actually, when I filed a brief on appeal, because it was a terrible decision, um, they settled the case on the spot. So it's not recorded anywhere that we won, but we actually did. So you're the only people in the world that know that the case spade case was actually a win for the photographer. Uh, I represented a, a photographer uh, against the New York Times, a very important copyright case. You know, this was the time, you know, in sort of 2004 to 2008, when the, uh, the internet was growing. Everybody threw stuff on the internet without any rights to do it. Uh, it was like the Wild West back then. Uh, I also represented uh, a lot of uh, sort of big Fortune 500 type companies in uh, their um, uh, sort of uh, counterfeit seizures. This is where people like, you know, sort of manufacture stuff. The one on the right is, that's the real Disney merchandise, and the one on the left is somebody copied it, that sort of, uh, so to speak. Um, the way we did that was we had, have investigators buy this stuff and compile all the evidence, then we'd, we'd sue like 500 companies at the same time to uh, enforce their rights. Uh, I was also uh, general counsel to the uh, International Advertising Association and SPAR, which was the Society for Photographers and Artists' Representatives, and a number of trade organizations like that. Uh, yeah, this slide I, I took from my presentation because I just think it's funny, mostly. Uh, in this case, uh, the principal defense brought by the defendant was people should know the difference between their face and their butt. Like, I'm not kidding, that was their defense. Didn't work well for them. <clears throat> uh, this, is, uh, I, this is the bike rack, actually, at Jupiter Beach. Um, it, it is actually the subject of what was a very important copyright case, because uh, they wanted to register that as a sculpture, basically. And the copyright office said, no, can't do it. Uh, and that's because, you know, if you take my seminar, you'd know, that any utilitarian use of any of this, it's not the subject of copyright. <clears throat> Gotta have a photo of a smiling monkey, I think, in any presentation to make it worthwhile. <clears throat> um, th this, this always makes me laugh when I see this picture. This actually is a very important sort of copyright case. This was the first monkey selfie. Uh, and the interesting thing about this case, and basic copyright law, is the person who creates the work is the author and owns it. Well, the monkey took the photo. So this became a very valuable photograph as the first monkey photo. And then a bunch of lawyers were like, wait a second, the monkey owns the rights to the photo. And that generated a whole bunch of uh, lawsuits. Uh, even the copyright office had a tried to change their rules to say that uh, uh, copyright property can only be made by humans. Uh, but the problem with that is they changed those rules after this photograph was taken, so that's still being litigated today. The monkey selfie. <clears throat> uh, this is a case I'm actually that's ongoing, Westminster Choir College. Uh, that's actually the most famous uh, choir uh, college in the world, uh, in Princeton, New Jersey and uh, Ryder tried to uh, dismantle them and sell them and so on, so we got together and prevented that. <clears> oh, <throat> uh, Taomu, um, this is an ongoing case too. Uh, he is uh, the top uh, tennis player in China in his age category, actually. Uh, and uh, he got involved in um, a terrible management agreement, which he sort of hired me to try to get him out of. Uh, which we're doing, uh, and uh, he actually found me because of the Hootie and the Blowfish case, because uh, you know that's a, that was a management dispute. <clears throat> I put this for comic relief. This is me making a, a, a vicious net shot here. Um, I should really change that slide. But uh, it's one of the things I love about Florida, actually. Uh, moving down here, uh, I was a pretty good tennis player as a young man, and then hadn't played for 30 years. Uh, and I moved down here, and I discovered you can actually do that here. Uh, I play like four or five times a week now, and it's like early in the morning, and I don't miss any time at work, and it's like a great lifestyle down here. It's one of the reasons I love this place. 
This is another reason why I love this place, is every morning I try to see the sunrise, because uh, it's really inspirational in a way. Um, and I never used to like to get up early, only when I sort of had to. I hated it, um, but, um, you know, uh, I can do that now, and it's actually a great source of inspiration. <clears throat> so that's it. That's me. Uh, if you have a camera on your phone, take a picture. That's my contact information. If you, you know, have any questions or concerns, you know, I have really de de devoted my pro professional career to, uh, <laughs> to representing artists, having been one myself. Uh, I relate to them. I know what it's all about. And I certainly know all the mistakes you make. So if you have any problems, feel free to call me. That's me. Thank you.